Welcome everyone. My name is Katie and I will be your moderator today. Today's webinar is 2024 Practice Valuation Trends and Insights. I'm, welcome, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Tom Snyder, Senior Director of Transition Services as our speaker today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we'll address them. Um, as, as we get them. And then CE is not available for this webinar on demand or live. Um, so welcome, Dr. Snyder. Thank you so much for being with us and I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. I'm glad uh, you're gonna be joining me today talking about a topic that I've been speaking on probably for 30 plus years. I've been in the profession for quite a while, I've seen a lot of changes. And as we're gonna talk about today, we'll even see more changes because our a profession is going through a lot of things and part of that has to do with valuations. So let's get started. So what we're going to cover today is talk about valuation trends around the country and why they do vary. Uh, we'll discuss common valuation methods that many practice valuators use. We'll speak a little bit about the key drivers of a practice valuation, what makes them tick, so to speak. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, strategies to improve your practice value after you've had an evaluation done. Uh, understanding EBITDA, which is now a very common valuation technique used by corporate dentistry. We'll also discuss establishing a baseline valuation for certain types of practice transitions. And then we'll talk a little bit about emergency exit strategy. So as you can see, we're gonna cover a lot of ground in the next hour or so. I hope you enjoy it. So there are lots of reasons to value your dental practice. Obviously, for many of you, you might be thinking of a practice sale the next year or two. So clearly, you'd like to know what your practice is worth. Or you may be thinking about it over the next five years or so and just want to get a feel for what your business is worth today to see if you're happy with that or what you could do to improve your value. Uh, for some of you, you might have an associate and you're thinking of bringing them in as a partner over the next year or two. Also, you may already be in a partnership and you really don't have a clear method to value the buyout, so you'll need a valuation to do that. We're gonna talk about emergency exit strategy at the end of our program, something that we feel is extremely important if something untoward would happen to you. Uh, Another reason for valuing your practice is for state and financial planning purposes. Also, if you're thinking of merging your practice with another practice, obviously valuations of both entities make a lot of sense. Personal goodwill, goodwill valuation is mostly for doctors who have professional corps or C-corps where they need a special evaluation to determine the value of their personal goodwill. And finally, hopefully uh, this is not too common, but if there is a matrimonial or partnership divorce, evaluations sometimes are necessary to set a price for that situation. Now let's talk about the practice valuation and transition landscape. As I referenced at the beginning, there've been lots of changes in our professions and we're still gonna see many more moving forward. And one of the biggest changes is practice modalities. Uh, right now, 75% of dentists practice at single location offices, of which about 36% are solo, true solo practitioners, one doctor only. But many doctors are practicing with another dentist or multiple dentists, might be a, a part-time specialist or two, or a full-time or part-time associate, but only one location. So really, uh, as looking at our landscape, we're still really a single location profession, but that's changing as well. The big change that we've seen is solo practice itself. When I graduated from dental school, most of my classmates wanted to go into solo practice. So I'd say it was about a 90 to 98% uh, goal of dentists to be a solo practitioner. Well, that's been changing dramatically. And in 2015, about 50% of 50% of dentists were solo. Now in 2022, that number has really dropped to 36%. Big change. What's going on? Well, this drop is very age specific. We still see that 50% of doctors 
who are 25 years from graduation or solo. So the majority of the older doctors, they started out that way. They're kind of winding down, getting ready for their retirement. So it's not a surprise that many of the older doctors are still solo practitioners. However, if you look at recent grads up to 10 years out of dental school, only 17% want to practice in the solo mode. So you can see that is a big seismic change to our profession. We also see that 24% uh, of graduates uh, from you know, 10 years up graduation, they're practicing in 10 or more locations. So clearly uh, lots of things are going on in our, in our profession for sure. Uh, from a valuation point of view, however, it's still primarily a seller's market. And we're gonna chat a little bit about how practice values do vary and why some values in the country are higher and lower than others. But for the most part, we still have more purchasers and sellers. Uh, the average retirement age of doctors is about 68.2, and that's been relatively stable. However, the big, big change is in retirement. Uh, most recently, the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute uh, is projecting that there's going to be a big surge of baby boomer retirement in the next three years. And of course, I think that's uh, pretty logical considering we have a, an older workforce uh, with about 30,000 doctors who are over the age of 65. We also, as I mentioned before, with solo practices really becoming less of a common model, we're seeing lots of consolidation. As a matter of fact, in 2019, 10.4% of U.S. dentists were affiliated with DSOs. 2023, that number has grown to 13%, and the numbers still increase. Many DSOs have changed their ownership model over the last 10 years for varying reasons, which we don't really have time to get into. But suffice to say, most of them now are shifting to a partnership model where they want to keep the selling doctor with them for period of time. Uh, and so that means longer post-sale employment is a common mode now with the DSOs. As we look at a newer generation of dental graduates, we see a big change. A generation ago, most dentists wanted to be a solo practitioner, number one, and wanted to own their own business. That has dramatically changed and continues to do so. As of 2023, 59.9% of females were practice owners and 79.9% of males were practice owners. So that trend is continuing. And I'm sure if we look five years in the future, that'll even be a smaller number of doctors who wanna be practice owners. So more doctors would rather work uh, for someone else uh, long-term, not just short-term. That the younger doctors are three times more likely to seek employment in large groups than they were 10 years ago. As a matter of fact, the American Dental Association, uh, as well as American Dental Education Association do lots of survey research on recent grads. And the IDEA, which is American Dental Education Association survey of the class of 23, found that 34% of their class plan to join a DSO. Uh, average debt of the class of 2023 was about $280,000 with about 19% having no debt. Uh, what we're finding is that the debt situation is starting to level off, uh, inflation adjusted, but it's still, for those folks who have to borrow money, is still a big impediment and might be a reason why some younger doctors feel they can never own, so hence they want to work for someone else. Now, if we look at the marketplace for purchasers, uh, we still find that the majority of recent grads still want to practice in urban and suburban areas, and that has a direct correlation to practice values because it's all about supply and demand as we'll discuss. Uh, so consequently, you're going to get higher values in urban and suburban markets than you would in smaller towns and rural areas where there aren't as many dentists. So that's something that has not changed and will continue to be that way, I think in the foreseeable future. So now let's get into the meat of the, the matter here and let's talk about practice valuations. What is your practice worth? And how do we figure out what your value is? Unfortunately, you know, we're dealing with 50 states, a big country, lots of dentists. So it's 
virtually impossible for me to tell you exactly what your practice is worth in your town. However, just to give you a perspective, the majority of practices that we value and as well as we sell, uh, and this includes specialty practices, okay? Uh, if we're using a metric called the value over prior year's gross receipts, that comes into a percentage. So what we're finding is that the majority of practices, both specialty and GP, are being valued and being sold between 60 to 85% of prior year's gross receipts. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, obviously, in some markets, as we'll talk about briefly, uh, much higher than that. Uh, and of course, if you're working in the, want to work in a corporate mode, you probably will get a higher value than that, uh, than what I just cited. But that gives you an idea of how the variance is, is calculated. And as you can see, this map shows lots, you know, every state of the union. And obviously there's the population has a lot to do with it, but it's the number of dentists in each state as well. For example, you know, you might find in rural Maine, a practice may find a maximum value of 60%. However, in Northwest Virginia, outside of DC, a general practice may sell as high as 90% or even more. Uh, in the Midwest, it may be in the mid eighties. Uh, Southern California in the, in the mid to high eighties, low nineties, it varies all over the map to be perfectly honest. And the same thing goes with specialists, but it really boils down to how many dentists are in the area. As I mentioned earlier, if you're in a rural area, you cannot expect to get maximum value. Why? Because there aren't a lot of buyers out there that are willing to pay the price versus if you're in an urban suburban area where there's an overabundance of purchasers, if there's an excellent practice on the market, be it a specialist or a GP, there's going to be demand and there's going to be competition. So that's really one of the things I want you to, to take away. You read a journal article, you just can't say a practice is worth 70%. That's not true. It's gonna vary where you are located for sure. That's a big takeaway I want you to remember. So let's talk a little bit about determining practice value. There are a couple of definitions. A classic definition on the left is called a fair market value. And that's the price at which a business will sell when offered for sale by a willing seller and purchased by a willing buyer, both being informed of the relevant facts and neither being under duress. That's fair market value. However, in the real world, from the dental side, we don't really deal with fair market value in a true sense of the word. We deal with more of a transactional value, which is the price the practice assets are likely to bring as a going concern in a particular area. Big, big difference is in most values, usually a doctor will pay someone or ask someone to prepare a valuation. So they are not a kind of a theoretical universe of sellers. It's a seller who oftentimes will pay a fee to get that valuation done. So really it's more of a transactional value. It just, it's a nuance, but it has, it has something to bear in terms of how valuations are done. Another important concept to remember uh, when you're looking at the value of your dental practice, it really consists of two asset classes. One are the intangible assets and the other are tangible assets. And typically we find that no matter whether it's a general practice, group practice, solo, uh, specialty practice, that the mix between intangible assets and tangibles is 75, 25, maybe 80, 20, but that usually predominantly is why values are so high because the intangible asset value is high. So the tangible assets, they're pretty easy to understand. Your dental and business equipment, technology, instruments and supplies, and leasehold improvements if you're a tenant. On the flip side, the intangible asset, which takes the lion's share of a practice's value, is primarily goodwill, some restrictive covenant, patient list, and in some cases, a phone number, specifically multi-location practice or specialty practice, phone number becomes an extremely important item. However, in the dental world, when valuations are done, they usually do not include the following, accounts receivable, cash and liabilities. So when it's time to come up with a net value for a transaction, one has to factor in these assets and liabilities to come up with the true value. 
So let's look at some common valuation approaches. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there that value dental practices. Uh, I've seen just about all the valuations that are out there. Some valuators only use one method. Many use two and three. Some use more than that. Uh, and some show formulas of how the valuations are done. Others just give you a number with a pro forma or a spreadsheet of how your value could be supported in a sale. So there's lots of different things going on, but what I'm going to cover is the basic approaches uh, that are used uh, when you're doing a formal evaluation. And typically there's three approaches. The first approach is called the market approach. And an approach means you know, a way of looking at it. We're looking at the market. And then from that, we apply certain types of formulas. In this particular case, we use the guideline transaction method. And what this method really do, does, it looks at a comparative sales. And we use various databases, for example, the Goodwill Registry, Pratt's stats now called deal stats. And uh, since we've been selling many dental practices for years, we have now developed our own robust database. So we get a feel for you know, what practices are valued at and what they sell for in the open market. So we've got that data. And basically, we're trying to give a potential doctor who wants a value what his or her practice is worth based on certain statistics that we use in a database. So it's really more of comparative sales. In light of that, I mentioned before, there are some folks when they do evaluation don't really give you a formal valuation as far as multiple methods and calculations. They give you a number. And so when they do that, they're typically using a gross revenue multiplier. And just as an example, I want to show you uh, how that may be misleading, not all the time, but just something to keep in consideration. Let's look at a practice uh, that's grossing 500,000. And let's assume that we're going to use the gross revenue multiplier of 75%. You know, evaluator in a particular market may say, well, in this market, I'm going to use 80%, or maybe in a, a more rural area, maybe 65 or 70, or even higher still. But again, it's a multiplier. It's what an expert in that area thinks it's worth. Now, practice B is grossing $700,000. So practice A is worth 375. Practice B is worth 525. Let's assume that in practice A, we have a nice overhead of 50%, which is not uncommon for smaller practices because uh, usually they don't have high overhead ratios. Sometimes that's not true, but usually they do. In this case, the net income is to 250. Practice B, a little larger, uh, they have an overhead of about 64.3 and their income is the same, same income. So uh, practice A has a net income of practice B and practice B has a net income of 250. However, uh, the values are quite different. So the question would be, if you were to buy that practice, which one would you prefer to purchase? Uh, and that's one of the problems with the gross revenue multiplier. It doesn't really dig down into the specifics, into the overhead and, the, and things that really are important. So again, just something to, to mention that it's really not truly a valuation method. It's just an approach to come up with an estimate of value. Now, the second approach that's used, that we use, is called the income approach. And this is a little more complicated than the market approach where we're using comparative statistics to come up with what we think your practice is worth in your particular area. In the income approach, we're gonna look at your tax returns. And the first thing we're gonna look at is your discretionary expenses. And we call those in the industry addbacks, things like continuing education, travel, gifts, contributions, certain insurances, perhaps health insurance, the owner's pension contribution. If there are family members that work for you that really maybe aren't truly employed, but are done for pension reasons, financial planning reasons, family members' contributions. So uh, those are things that are really belong to you, even though you report it as an expense. 
the income approach, really, when we look at this, what we're trying to do is come up with what the true cash flow is. Typically, we'll look at four years financial. Some valuators use three, some will use five, uh, but in, more, in a more traditional valuation, with four is, is a good number to work with. We prefer to use tax returns because that's the only way a valuator can kind of assume that the information that they've been given by the client is accurate because they filed it with the Internal Revenue Service as opposed to a profit and loss where that wasn't reported, it was just self-generated. So we still request that, but sometimes we have good information in there to support the tax return if we have questions. But what a valuator does, in addition to adding back those expenses, they're gonna look at certain other expenses and they're going to normalize them. And what do I mean by that? Well, we wanna make sure that when we're doing evaluation that we're using uh, national averages so that, for example, if somebody says my dental supply ratio is 18% and we know clearly that it might be no higher than 10, we may normalize that to 10% and add the 8% back. Why? Because maybe the doctor in one particular year purchased a lot of supplies for whatever reason and threw that number off. Office expense is a common one where a lot of accountants throw different types of items in there. And so we look at the ratios. If it's not within the ratios that we're comfortable with, we'll normalize that. The same thing with rent. Usually rent is normalized when the doctor owns his or her facility where they may be under or overpaying the rent. We try to normalize that because what we wanna do is if we're valuing a practice, we wanna have a realistic look at what the true expenses are. And if a doctor is being inefficient, uh, we're going to normalize that back. The same thing goes with professional fees. Someone has a consultant, they're spending $30,000 a year in a consulting program. Maybe if that practice was sold, uh, the purchaser may still have a consultant, but not spend as much. So we'll normalize that. And sometimes we'll do that with building repairs and maintenance based on whether the doctor owns that or not. So the method that we use is a capitalized cash flow or a capitalized capitalization of earnings. And what we're looking at is uh, we're looking at on the present value of the future economic benefit. You know, what are going to be the sustainable earnings before interest and taxes? We're trying to figure out if we're going to buy this practice, you know, what kind of earnings are we going to generate? Now, inside that are certain risk factors. For example, is it a specialty practice? Is it a general practice? What size revenue? What type of payer mix do we have? Do we have a lot of uh, PPOs? Do we have Medicare and Medicaid? Uh, what kind of systems? And, and more importantly, where is the practice located? So there are various risk factors. There's many more than that, but just as an idea, evaluator will have a checklist and we'll have a rating scale and they'll program that in. So there'll be either a high or a low risk to that particular uh, uh, practice. For example, uh, associate without a restrictive covenant in states that enforce restrictive covenants, that would be a negative. So that's another risk factor. Okay. So what we're trying, and then we also then we'll look at certain financial market returns where we come up uh, with what we call a cap rate, a return on equity. And so what you need to know is the higher the cap rate, the lower the value, the lower the cap rate, the higher the value, because the higher the cap rate, that means various risk factors and other market factors are making that rate higher, which means it's not as desirable investment, hence a lower value. And the final approach that we use is called the asset approach. And that's a fairly simple one to understand. Net asset method is the, the next method that we're using. And here we're looking at the tangible and intangible assets. What we're really gonna do here is do a market value of the equipment and technology, as well as the market value of the supplies and inventory. And then we're going to have a goodwill value, which we derive from the various databases that I referenced before. And we add up the goodwill value and the market value of equipment and supplies and we come up with the net asset method. So what does evaluator do? Well, after they look at these three methods, applying the, the different formulas, we're then going to take three methods and in certain cases, based on how the, how the analysis works, sometimes an evaluator may throw out 
one of the three methods because it's not consistent. But usually they will base it on these three and take an average of the three. So that's how evaluation is done using three particular evaluation methods. Now let's uh, talk for a second about something that many of you have heard of, read about, it's called EBITDA, and that's obviously growing in popularity. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> that's defined as earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Why use EBITDA versus net income? You know, for many, many years, valuators like myself would use net income as the way to value a dental practice. But with changes in our marketplace, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, EBITDA became a growing favorite, particularly in the corporate world. Net income provides a more comprehensive view, it looks at overall profitability as it takes into account all expenses. It includes non-operating -op expenses. And net income has traditionally been used to evaluate a company's financial health. However, EBITDA is something that the folks in the investment world have used for many years when they purchase businesses because they really want to drill down and truly, really look at the company's operating performance. And they want to have a metric that they can use to compare company to company, which in this case would be dental practice. So when DSOs look at a dental practice, you know, they're comparing that particular practice they're considering to acquire versus another practice they're considering to acquire. So they're gonna look at the EBITDA as a very big driver on whether they wanna make that investment in practice A or B or pass on both because the EBITDA may not be strong enough. So it's, it gives them a much clearer picture and that's why EBITDA has been, is really how DSOs will value your dental practice. Now, EBITDA, unlike before when I talked to you about the ratio of practice value to last year's gross receipts, it's a little different in the corporate world because now we're using a multiple of EBITDA. So the EBITDA number is multiplied in general practices, usually between four to seven. That equates to maybe gross revenue percentage of 80% to 120%, 25% or even higher. But remember, that's not an absolute. These multiples are highly dependent on the size of the practice, if the doctor is going to stay for a while. So you can't say, well, gee, my practice is worth four times EBITDA. It may not be worth that. It may be worth more. And in some mitigating circumstances, maybe a little bit less. Uh, so again, it's just to give you an idea how a DSO may value a solo standing general practice versus if they're looking at multiple locations, obviously that's more uh, valuable to them. And you can see at least 12 times EBITDA or even more higher values. Again, it's just uh, something that uh, is very common now. So, uh, you know, sometimes our doctors want us to look at the EBITDA as well as the conventional value, but just so you know what's going on. Now in calculating EBITDA, uh, remember, Valuators have their own way of looking at things. And it's no different when a corporation looks at your practice and applies an EBITDA formula. Uh, they're going to look at your revenue. Usually they like to look at what's called a trailing 12 months, uh, the last 12 months of your performance. They're gonna look at your overhead and they're gonna adjust it. Well, by the way though, the adjustments for EBITDA in corporate valuations may be different than what we call a valuation for a private sale, a conventional valuation, where their ratios may be somewhat different because of their experience owning a lot of practices. Maybe they have a lower adjustment for dental supplies or office supplies, for example. Uh, depending on the technology, uh, even lab expense could be adjusted. They also then will subtract uh, what we call a production compensation for the owner. They will impute a ratio of commission. Usually it's between 30 and 35. Again, that's gonna vary based on the particular company doing the valuation. So again, they'll also uh, look at a specialty and they modify that 
higher uh, for especially versus the GP. But the bottom line is they're coming up with an EBITDA calculation. So they'll use their own internal ratios. There's no standard, so to speak. Unfortunately, uh, every company is a little different. Not that they're radically different, but they are a little bit different. However, it's the same concept to the capitalization of earnings method. The only difference is that in the EBITDA model, you're really looking at a non-owner and really what you're trying to do with this EBITDA is saying, gee, after all my expenses are paid, you know, and my I pay my doctors, uh, if I want to be an owner, whether I'm a dentist or not, or a corporation, I want to be able to have some cash because I have other things to do with that. So that's really what EBITDA is all about. It's all about cash. And obviously, the lower the risk, the higher the value, and the higher the risk, the lower the value as far as lower and higher EBITDA, the same concept. Now, there are some things that affect the dental practice's value, uh, and I'm speaking more in the conventional sense right now of what I call for private sale, if you will. Uh, so let's talk about them. Clearly, I think you've understood from what I've said thus far that where you are practicing will have a significant impact on your value. Uh, and that's just supply and demand. Where are you, urban, suburban, small town, rural, obviously. What are some of the uh, demographics to support that area? Is it a diversified industry? Uh, is it a university community that has a lot of research? Uh, or, you know, is it there are industries or there's only one or two industries? You know, things of that nature do have a bearing. How about growth? Is there recent or planned commercial and residential development? So, you know, some valuators will look at some demographic reports to get a feel for is this area really going places? And is it a strong area that's going to support more people and hence need more dentists and hopefully, you know, higher values for the doctors? The next uh, set of things to look at is the facility. Uh, how many treatment rooms? What's the age and condition of the dental equipment? Is there technology? How recently has the technology been purchased? What types of technology? And importantly, is there room for expansion? Okay. Uh, how about the business and the reception area? You know, every practice is different. Uh, but to be honest with you, uh, the facility is, is much, many times when we do evaluation, our clients get a little upset if they think their value should be higher because their facility is really state of the art. Uh, that's only one of the factors. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, a driving factor more so than facility, unfortunately it is true, is the profitability of the practice, but it's still a, a key component. But just so you understand, it's just one of many that really go into the mix. But this overhead issue is, is a big deal, right? Why is it a big deal? Because obviously, if if I'm going to buy your business, wouldn't I rather buy a business with a lower overhead ratio than a higher overhead ratio? I've got to work harder to make my profit if I have a higher overhead office. Um, now, not to pick on doctors that have high overhead, it's not necessarily their fault because they didn't mismanage their practice. It's just that they have staff that have been with the doctor maybe for 15, 20 years. So it's not uncommon to see overhead ratios 30 to 35%, hopefully not higher. I've seen some that are higher. So these are long-term employees. Oftentimes they have pension plans. And for doctors who may be, <clears throat> excuse me, in urban areas where rent is very high in many places, double digit, uh, that really drives overhead too. In addition to those factors, uh, there are some other things that we need to consider that can affect your value. Uh, are you doing any specialty procedures, ortho, sleep medicine, two common ones? And why is that important to understand that? Well, if I'm valuing your practice and I include all these procedures, if in fact this value is for a potential sale, not for financial planning or estate planning or for emergency exit strategy, which is a different issue, right? But if I'm thinking about selling my business, and I don't perform, or the owner, I should say the, the new owner, will not perform these procedures, then an adjustment to value is forthcoming. So it's important to know these in case 
what you're going to, what are you going to be doing with your valuation has a lot to, a lot to do with how the final value is going to come out. If it's not for a sale, then everything's fine. But if it's going to be for a sale, then these things should be recorded. Not that we don't include it in the valuation, but if a potential buyer is not going to do those procedures, then they will be uh, lowering your value for sure. How about insurance plans? Are you a Delta Premier provider? And if so, uh, if a buyer comes in and can't be credentialed and they have to flip to the Delta Premier PPO portfolio, that could mean a reduction in value. In fact, in our valuations, when we have a Delta Premier provider, we put in our cover letter that we give them a value as we see it. But we indicate that since you re responded that you were a Delta Premier provider, it's conceivable that your value may not be exactly what we said it was. It may be adjusted downward if your potential buyer, if it's for sale, is a, a non-credential doctor. So uh, staff instability, uh, that also can affect value, a lot of turnover. Uh, there could be some family sta staffing where family members are in the practice but will not be there after the transition. Uh, such things as non-transferable telephone number and our website is another thing that could have a value. Not a big number uh, reduction, but there nonetheless. And associates without enforceable and transferable restrictive covenants in states that enforce them. And we do recognize uh, that you know there's some discussion about uh, invalidating uh, restrictive covenants, but in the states where they are enforced, if there is no uh, restrictive covenant, that has an impact on value. And a big impact on value if you're uh, in a tenant situation is if there is a lease with only one year left and no renewable, no renewability, or you have no lease at all. Obviously, that's going to have a negative impact on value. So there's a number of factors that really can have an impact on your value. So now let's say, you know, you're not thinking of doing anything as far as your uh, transition plans for the next few years. You just want to get a, an idea of what you think a professional thinks your practice is worth. So that if it's you're comfortable with the number, that's great. If you're not, what can you do to enhance your value? So let's talk about a few things that could help you to enhance your value. And as far as what we call the top line, first thing we recommend is getting a fee analysis uh, done. Uh, because many doctors don't really look at their fees on an annual basis and don't really make any changes. Even though, as we all know, one of the, the top three things that are really concerning dentists uh, moving into 2024, according to the ADA's Health Policy Institute, is increasing costs, increasing operations, notwithstanding staff shortages and the like. So that's a big deal. So you've got to stay up with your uh, the competition, uh, competition, Many times they're going to increase their fees as well, and you should as well, because if not, you can see if you don't, you're really hurting yourself. For example, a 5% fee increase in a practice with a 40% profit margin can generate an 11% increase in net profit. So that's a good way to improve your bottom line. Uh, there may be other ways if you're thinking of growing, uh, you're not ready to do anything for a few years. If there's a doctor in your area who's thinking of retiring, you might consider purchasing their records. I'm sure a number of you did that during COVID where we had a lot of doctors who did not go back to their office for obvious reasons. And so there were a lot of record sales going on just a few short years ago, but there are still doctors out there who may have a practice where may, even in the Northeast, it could be a home office. Uh, it could be a doctor without a lease or a lease that's not renewable, but maybe you could purchase their records and that could give them an exit strategy as well as give you a real, a real nice bump in your receipts. Uh, taking a good look at your hygiene department, if you're a general practice, looking at the ratio of hygiene services to overall services. Uh, there are ways that you can grow adding more uh, perio services, for example. How about a marketing plan? Do you have a social media campaign? Uh, how about your website? When was the last time you looked at your website? Does it need to be enhanced? If you look at other websites in the area, let's face it, uh, patients today are making more and more of the, their decisions, not so much by word of mouth, but on the internet. So you've really got to be on top of your game there for sure. Uh, looking at your service mix, <clears throat> are there any services that can be added? There may be some services that maybe if you've been practicing for a number of years, 
uh, you've really started to refer out, but maybe you might, might need those uh, services to be brought back in. And that's one of the reasons why some doctors, if they have the patient base, will look at an associate to come in and provide some of those services. And finally, uh, with all the computer software out there and the ability to really look at our practice very, very precisely and in a granular way, looking at our treatment plans and our conversion rates, you know, are there ways that we can enhance treatment acceptance? So those are some ways that if you have the time to do it, it's well worth it to take those steps and try to make those improvements. Now, as far as your facility, uh, you know, you might need a little facelift, some cosmetic enhancements, coat of paint. Maybe you need to redo your flooring, maybe some new furniture in the reception room, whatever it may be, uh, just making it look uh, nicer, so to speak, if it hasn't been really attended to in a number of years. Uh, you may consider up upgrading your dental equipment and of course, clinical technology, which we know uh, there's so much out there. And as we know, no sooner you buy clinical technology in a few years, you're you know looking at upgrades and updates. Uh, so one thing you have to understand is when you make investments in technology and equipment, you don't necessarily get a dollar for dollar increase in your practice value. <clears throat> as I mentioned that earlier before, uh, having up-to-date equipment and technology is important, but it doesn't drive uh, the majority of your practice's value. And one of the big questions is not just to be competitive, but you have to decide if I invest in these assets, in, especially in clinical technology, will it increase my production? Because that really is going to increase your revenue if you make those investments. However, our own caution is if you're planning on selling within 12 to 24 months, uh, depending on the tax treatment of those assets by your CPA, you need to talk about uh, those particular tax ramifications, which is called depreciation recapture before you make those investments. Now let's take another look at a few more items related to net profit, uh, looking at your overhead ratios. <clears throat> And are they comfortable with national average? Uh, maybe, you know, we have databases that we can share with you. Uh, we do it with our clients. So we can help guide you in what we think overhead ratios should be, which are realistic and reliable. Uh, taking a look at your current staffing, are you overstaffed? You have a, a 30 or four or 35% uh, ratio and you really need all those staff members. Are there ways that you can become a little more efficient? Uh, and of course, the, another big one is PPO exposure. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned before that ADA survey that was recently done, the, the big three things uh, dentists are looking at in 2024, looking at uh, insurance relationships is one that many doctors are considering uh, repositioning or at least examining their dependence on PPOs. And how do you do that? Well, you've got to take a look at the PPOs that you're doing business with and track the production and look at the related write-offs. So if there are some that you're really not gaining much, you should consider whether or not it makes sense for you to drop those plans. So those are things you just need to do, which hopefully will increase your bottom line. But I wanna talk for a minute about creating a baseline valuation. Now, why is this important? This is really important for those doctors who may have an associate who joined them uh, a year ago and that they want to become a partner, or it may be a situation where you brought a candidate in, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, you might want to sell them their pra your practice in a year or two. So baseline values are really ideal for deferred buy-ins or deferred sales. So why do a baseline value? Well, obviously it makes sense, as I said before, for a deferred buy-in or deferred sale. And I don't know an associate out there who is excited to work in a practice and contribute a lot. And then all of a sudden, right before their time to buy in or buy that practice, the value is updated. And, you know, that person usually is going to complain. And so that's something uh, that needs to be considered because they don't want to pay for the production <clears throat> that they've generated to give you a higher value. So by doing a baseline value that eliminates the issue. Now, baseline values are not something you cast in concrete for five years. 
usually they're good for one, no more than two years. So it's really for more of an imminent uh, transaction. Instead of redoing a value, it's better to use a baseline value because if that doctor is working for you and working hard, you're going to make a higher profit on their efforts when they're your associate, but they feel better treated because when they come in the door, they know what the practice is worth. In fact, many doctors like when they bring an associate in, and we recommend within the first year, you bring an associate in to have that baseline value done so that if there is a transaction occurring in the next year or so, uh, you don't have to have a big battle over a new value and then trying to consider discounts. Totally different story, and I've seen this happen more often than not, is somebody who's been in the practice for four or five years, no value was ever done, then a value is done and they want to form a partnership. It's not a surprise that uh, the buying doctor wants some kind of a production discount, but we're talking really a baseline value here. And hopefully if you consider that for short term transactions, you'll avoid some, some issues for sure. And uh, we still do believe in a baseline value that the owner of the seller can make an adjustment to the original value, but how do we do that? Well. We talked about intangible and tangible assets before. Intangible assets predominantly are goodwill. So what do we do? We have a baseline value. We can determine from our value, original value, based on the methods we use, what the value of the intangible assets of the goodwill is and what the value of the tangible assets are. So when it comes to the goodwill part of it, we then adjust that goodwill by the impact on inflation. And how do we do that? Uh, we go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics inflation calculator. If you were to go on, on the website to bls.gov, you'll see on one of the home pages an inflation calculator. And basically, you plug in a number for a certain date, hit calculate, and it gives you within two months what that current value is worth. Because, you know, inflation has been an issue. Uh, and so why, if, you, if I have a baseline value of $500,000, why should I sell it in two years for 500,000 if in fact inflation is in the marketplace? And with the tangible assets, uh, that becomes even more critical because what if you bought some equipment uh, during that period of time that needs to be factored in so you update the market value. Again, uh, it's just a fair way in our opinion to update a value for a short-term baseline value. Now, finally, I want to close on something that we consider extremely important. Uh, since uh, many doctors are still practicing on their own, uh, they should know what their value is worth because, uh, you know, we believe uh, very strongly in solid transition planning. So you need to have evaluation to determine what your exit strategy is. But if something were to happen to you, uh, what is your practice worth and what needs to be done? So some statistics uh, that about 30% of practices will sell if, if a doctor passes within 90 days. Uh, an additional 10% uh, will sell after, only an additional 10% will sell after 90 days. And finally, uh, more than 90 days, most practices do not sell at all unless there's some mitigating circumstances that there's locum tenens doctors and the hygienists have stayed. But if the practices are dark, no one's there, the patients are going to seek another doctor. So you can see when you don't have a plan of action, the value that you've worked your whole life for is going to dissipate almost overnight, which is unfortunate. So we firmly believe that you should protect your family by uh, leaving a letter of instruction uh, which is a document, which I'll reference in a minute, which gives advisors as well as your family instructions on what to do if you're unable to do anything. And, and that usually is accompanied by a practice valuation. Okay. So that's one of our strong suits. We think it's very important to have your practice value uh, and have this letter of instruction uh, prepared. And, you know, sometimes if you have a trusted transition broker, uh, you can name them in your letter of instruction. As a matter of fact, uh, our letter of instruction, and I'll show you how you can get it online, uh, 
it is a document that is an interactive PDF. So if you'd like to have that, you can. And basically you just fill in the blanks and give it to your spouse, give it to your attorney and or accountant. So if God forbid something were to happen to you, that an action plan can occur as opposed to waiting uh, for months. And that's where the tragedy occurs, where a doctor's value and his whole his whole career just really goes down the drain relative to value because no plans have been made. It's a, it's a rather uh, a somber thing, but yet it just needs to be done. So uh, we strongly believe that you should consider that along with getting a current value and then perhaps updating that value every few years uh, so that you've got that in your portfolio. If you're not doing anything other than that, I think that's an important uh, task that you should undertake. So uh, in today's uh, program, we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of different ideas. Uh, we couldn't get, go into the weeds, so to speak, with a lot of technical talk, which wouldn't really uh, be a benefit for this hour that we're together, but just to give you a, a pretty good understanding of values. And I hope the biggest takeaway is uh, the value in your area is the value in your area, not what your friend in dental school got maybe five states over because they're in a different market. It's important to understand that. Why do we know that? Because we talk to people all the time and you know, just remember that it's really uh, based on where you practice. And of course, uh, what really drives the value at the end of the day, of course, is equipment, but it's that bottom line that people are looking at because when you buy someone else's business, you're buying someone's earnings. So I mentioned before the letter of instruction. And if you'd like a copy, you go to henryshinedpt.com backslash what if, and you'll be able to download that. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to complete that, give it to your loved ones and your advisors. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, talk to one of our local reps and have evaluation done. So you can complete that process and get your emergency exit strategy underway. So again, I want to thank you for your attention. I hope you found this uh, time together to be valuable, that I've given you a few pearls to uh, take with and think about. So thank you uh, for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Snyder, for a wonderful presentation, and thank you all for joining us. We did record today's webinar, and we'll be emailing it out sometime within the next week. We would appreciate your feedback via survey that will pop up on your screen shortly, and thank you all for joining us again. We look forward to see, seeing you on future webinars. Have a good day, everyone.